Hi, I'm Sharon from Wyndham City Libraries. Welcome back to Teen Read Along for Chapter 5 of Tomorrow When the War Began by John Marsden. In the last chapter, the V-shaped planes with no lights were spotted by Ali. Let's find out about the group's camp in Hal and what they get up to. So let's read Chapter 5. We got fat and lazy camping in the clearing. Every day someone would say, OK, today we're definitely going up to the top and doing a good long walk. And every day we'd all say, yeah, I'll come. Yeah, we're getting too slack. Yeah, good idea. Somehow, though, we never got around to it. Lunchtime would creep up on us. Then there'd be a bit of serious sleeping to do, a bit of reading or paddling in the creek. And then it'd be mid-afternoon, getting on to late afternoon. Corrie and I were probably the most energetic. We took a few walks back to the bridge or to different cliffs so we could have long private conversations. We talked about boys and friends and school and parents, all the usual stuff. We decided that when we left school, we'd earn some money for six months and go overseas together. We got really excited about it. I want to stay away for years and years, Corrie said dreamily. Corrie, you got homesick on the year eight camp. That was only four days. That wasn't real homesickness. That was because Ian and them were giving me such a hard time. Weren't they such mongrels? I hated them. Remember when they got caught bombing us with fire lighters? They were crazy. At least they've improved since then. Ian's still a dork. I don't mind him now. He's all right. Corrie was much more forgiving than me, more tolerant. So will your parents let you go overseas, I asked. I don't know. They might, if I work on them long enough. They let me apply for that exchange thing, remember? Your parents are so easy to get on with. So are yours. Oh, most of the time I guess they are. It's only when Dad's in one of his moods and he's awfully sexist. All the stuff I had to go through just to come on this trip? If I was a boy, it'd be no problem. Mmm, my dad's not bad. I've been educating him. I smiled. A lot of people underestimated Corrie. She just quietly worked away on people till she got what she wanted. We figured out our itinerary. Indonesia, Thailand, China, India, then up to Egypt. Corrie wanted to go from there into Africa, but I wanted to go on to Europe. Corrie had this idea that if she'd have a look at everything, come home, do nursing, then go back and work in the country that needed nurses most. I admired her for that. I was more interested in making money. So the time drifted by. Even on our last full day when food was getting short, no one could be bothered going all the way back to the Land Rover to get more. Instead, we improvised and put together snacks that at any other time we would have chucked at the nearest rubbish bin. We ate meals that I wouldn't have fed to our chooks. There was no butter left, no powdered milk, no condensed milk because we'd sucked the tubes dry on our first day. No fruit, no tea, no cheese, no chocolate. That was serious, but not serious enough to motivate us to get off our butts. It's catch 20 something, Kevin explained. If we had chocolate, it'd give me the energy to get up to the land here to get some more. But without it, I don't think I could make it to the first step. It was hot. That was our main excuse. Homer was still wrapped in fee, always wanting to talk to me about her, trying to accidentally put himself wherever she happened to be going, turning red every time she spoke to him. But fee was being very frustrating. She wouldn't discuss it with me at all, just pretended that she didn't know what I was talking about, when it must have been obvious to anyone short of a coma. The seven of us had got through five days without a serious argument, which was good going. Quite a few little arguments, I admit. There was a time Kevin had blown up at Fee for not doing any cooking or washing up. It was after the great snake schmozzle. I think Kevin was embarrassed that he hadn't come out of that with much credit. Then his sausage surprise got such a poor response, so he probably was feeling a bit sensitive. Still, Fee was getting a reputation for disappearing when work appeared, so Kevin wasn't f- too far wrong. There was Corrie's frequent cry-, cry of, That's not funny, Homer, heard when he tipped cold water on her in his sleeping bag, when he did cruel and disgusting things to a black beetle, he dropped a spider down her shirt, and he tore out the last page of her book and hid it so she didn't know what the lovers made up or not. Corrie was one of Homer's favourite victims. He only had to give her a glimpse of the red cape and she charged at it every time. It was lucky she didn't hold any grudges. If I'm going to be honest, I'd better admit that I managed to annoy one or two people once or twice. Kevin told me I was a know-all when I made a few suggestions about rearranging the fire. In fact, the fire got me in trouble a few times. I guess I liked fiddling with it a bit too much. Whenever it died down a little, or the smoke started coming in the wrong direction, or the billy wasn't over the best coals, I'll be in there with a stick, fixing it. Well, that's what I called it. The others called it being a bloody nuisance. My worst fight really was stupid. I don't know, maybe all fights are really stupid. We started talking about the colours of cars, which one's the most conspicuous, and which one's the least. Kevin said white was the most conspicuous, and black the least. Lee said yellow and green. I said red and khaki. I forget what the others said. Suddenly got quite heated. Why do you think they paint ambulances and police cars white? Kevin yelled. Why do you think they paint fire engines red? I yelled back. 
Why do you think they have so many yellow taxis? Lee yelled a bit, although I don't think his heart was in it. It went on and on. I thought I was on safe ground with Khaki for inconspicuous, because that's what the army uses. But Kevin told some long story about how he nearly had a head-on with a black car a week after he got his peas. That doesn't prove black's hard to see, I said. It just proves you shouldn't be allowed on the roads. I can't remember how it ended, which goes to show how stupid it was. But on our last night, sitting around the fire playing true confessions, Robin unexpectedly said, I don't want to go back. This is the best place. This has been the best week. Yeah, said Lee. It's been great. I'm looking forward to a hot shower though, Fee said, and decent food. Let's do this again, Curry said, back here in the same place with the same people. Yeah, okay, Homer said, obviously thinking of another five days to spend adoring Fee. Let's keep this place a secret, Robin said, otherwise everyone will start using it and I'll be wrecked in no time. It is a good campsite, I said. Next time we should have a proper search for where the hermit lived. It might have had just a shelter here and it's fallen down, Lee said. But he built that bridge so well. You'd think he'd build his shelter even better. Well, maybe he just lived in a cave or something. True confessions resumed, but I went to bed before they could make me confess to all the things I'd done with Steve. I figured I'd told enough already, so I got out while the going was good. But I didn't sleep well. Like I said, normally I was a heavy sleeper, but the last few nights I just couldn't settle down to it. To my own surprise, I realised I was quite anxious to get home, to see how things were, to make sure it was all okay. I did feel some kind of strange anxiety. In the morning, everyone got moving early, but it's a funny thing. You can have 90% of the work done in the first hour, but the other 10% takes at least two hours. That's Ali's law. So it was nearly 11 o'clock and starting to warm up before we were ready to go. Our last check of the fire, a regretful farewell to our secret clearing when we hit the track. But it was a steep climb and we soon began to realise why we hadn't been too keen to do day trips back onto Taylor's Stitch. Our biggest motivation, apart from Fee's enthusiasm for showers and food, was to see where the track started at the top. We couldn't figure out how we, and all those other people over the years, had missed it. So we kept plugging along, sweating and grunting up the hardest bits, sometimes pushing the person in front through a narrow gap in Satan's steps. I noticed Homer stayed close to Fee, giving her helpful pushes whenever he got the chance, and she'd smile at him and he'd go red. Could she possibly like him, May- maybe? I wondered. Or was she enjoying stringing him along? It'd serve Homer right if a girl did that to him. One girl could get revenge for all of us. Our packs were lighter, thanks to all the food we'd eaten, though after a short time they felt as heavy as ever. But soon enough we were close to the top and looking ahead to see where we'd come out. The answer, when we got close enough to us, was surprising. The track suddenly veered right away from Satan's steps and struck out across a landslide of loose gravel and rocks. This was the first time we'd been out in the open since leaving the campsite. It took a few minutes to find it again on the other side because it was much fainter and thinner. It was like going from a road onto a four-wheel drive track. It was in public view, but it still would have been invisible to anyone standing on the arete, and anyone stumbling across it would have thought it was just an animal track. It continued to wind upwards then, finishing at a big old gum tree near Wombagonu. The last hundred metres were through a scrub so thick that we had to bend double to get along the path. It was almost like a tunnel but it was very clever because people looking down from Wampagona would see only impenetrable bush. The gum tree was at the base of a sheet of rock that stretched up to Wampagona's summit. It was an unusual tree because it had multiple trunks, which must have parted from each other in its early days, so now that they grew out like petals on a poppy. The track actually started in the bowl in the middle of the tree. It brought us cunningly into the bowl by leading us under one of the trunks. The bowl was so big that the seven of us could squash into it, Either side of the tree and below it was the jungly scrub of hell. Above was a sheet of rock which, as Robin said, would leave no tracks. It was a perfect setup. We took a break on Wampagonu, not for long because we had virtually no food left. We'd all been too lazy to carry any water up from the creek. It was about a 40 minute walk to the faithful Land Rover, which we found where we'd left it, backed in under the shady trees, patiently waiting. We fell upon it with cries of delight, getting to the water first, then picking out on the food, even the healthy stuff that we rejected five days earlier. It's amazing how quickly your attitudes can change. I remember hearing on the radio someone saying how prisoners of war had been so grateful for any little scrap of food when they were liberated at the end of World War II. Then two days later they were complaining because they got chicken noodle soup instead of tomato. That was just like us. And still is. That date the landy I was dreaming of an ice cream I'd chucked out from the fridge at home a week earlier because it had too many little ice crystals sticking to it. I'd have given anything to have had it back in my hand. I couldn't have believed how casually I'd thrown it away. 
but after an hour or two at home, I guess I would have thrown it away again. Once we got to the Land Rover, it seemed like the others lost any sense of urgency to get home. It was a hot day, humid, with quite a low cloud drifting past. You couldn't see the coast at all. It was the kind of weather that sapped your energy. That wasn't really true for me, though. I was still a bit uneasy, keen to get back, wanting to check that everything was okay, but I couldn't force the others to go at my pace. I was affected by Robin telling me just that morning that I was bossy. I was a bit hurt by that, especially coming from Robin, who didn't normally say any unkind things. So I kept quiet while everyone lay around in the patchy sunlight, sipping off the effects of all the food we'd just eaten. After a while, Kevin and Corey disappeared down the road away. Homer was lying as close as he dared to get to Fee, but she didn't seem to be taking any notice of him. I talked to Lee a bit about life in the restaurant. It was interesting. I didn't realise how hard it was. He said his parents wouldn't use microwaves or any modern inventions. They still did things in the traditional way, so that meant a lot more work. His father went down to the markets twice a week, leaving at 3.30 in the morning. I didn't think running a restaurant would suit me once I heard that. Eventually, around mid-afternoon, we got going, picking up Kevin and Corrie down the road a kilometre or so. We lurched our way down at about the same speed we'd lurched our way up. As we got a better view of the plains, we were surprised to see six different fires in the distance scattered across the countryside. Two looked quite big. It was really too early in the year for major bushfires, but too late for burning off. But that was the only unusual thing we noticed, and none of the fires were remotely close to our places. At the river, there was a majority vote for a swim, so we stopped again for a long time, more than an hour. I was getting quite edgy, but there was nothing I could do to hurry them up. I only swam for five minutes, and Lee didn't go in at all. So when I came out of the water, I sat and talked to him again. After a while, I said, I wish I'd get a move on. I'm really keen to get home. Lee looked at me and said, why? I don't know. I'm in a funny mood, a bad mood. Yes, you seem a bit wound up. Maybe it's those fires. I can't figure them out. But you've been uptight most of this hike. Have I? Yes, I suppose I have. I don't know why. It's strange, Lee said slowly, but I feel the same way. Do you? You don't show it. I try not to. Yes, I believe that. Maybe it's guilt I added after a while. I feel bad about missing the show. We exhibit there quite a lot. Dad thinks we should support it. It takes ages grooming stock and getting them in there and brushing and feeding and walking them and then presenting them. Dad was cool about it and I didn't help groom them, but I left him with an awful lot of work. Do you only take them to there to help keep the show going? No. It's quite an important show, especially for Charolais. It helps keep your name in front of people so they realise you're a serious breeder. You've got to be so PR conscious nowadays. That's one thing the same about restaurants. Here they come. Sure enough, Robin and Fee, the last two people left in the water, were coming out, dripping and laughing. Fee looked fantastic, flicking her long hair out of her eyes and moving with the grace of a heron. I sneaked a look at Homer. Kevin was talking to him and Homer was trying to act like he was listening while he stared frantically at Fee at the corner of his eyes. But looking again I was, at Fee, I was sure that she knew. There was just something just a bit self-conscious about the way she was walking, the way she stood there in the cooling sunlight, like a model doing a fashion shoot on a beach. I think she knew it and loved it. It was about half an hour from the swimming hole to home. I don't know if I was happy that day. Those tense energy feelings were getting stronger and stronger. But I do know I've never been happy since. The group have a close connection despite a few small arguments. However, they're portrayed as lazy teens, talking about going hiking, but they never do. Do you think they're lazy or just typical teens on a holiday? Join me again in the next episode for Chapter 6 of Tomorrow, When the War Began.